Thank you, Randy. Can we just do it? No, it's fine. Thank you, Pastor John. Good morning, everyone. What a thrill it is for me and my wife to be here with you this morning in this church and the spirit of this meeting. It's a, it's a real blessing. And I look forward for each opportunity that I have to, to come back here. I travel a lot all over the world. And I have friends in almost every country as God has led us from many different places. But this place here indeed is a very special place and your pastor for me is a very special brother. We communicate very often as we call each other back and forth. So I thank the Lord that I can be here today and a part of this seminar series dealing with creation and evolution and to partner with Dr. Oliver, who will be speaking to you this evening. And I strongly recommend that you would come back and hear his message this evening. My topic this morning will deal with more or less an overview of the creation-evolution controversy. And I've titled it, Creation, Foundation of the Christian Faith. You see, every one of you will have asked these questions or have had someone ask you the question at one time in your life. Why do I exist? Is there a God who created me? Or is there some other way to explain my existence? Like this concept, this idea, this belief of evolution, a natural process, doesn't require a supernatural creator. How can we know the truth about the subject of origins? Well, this morning I trust that we will be able to come to a conclusion. If you are still questioning some of these and you don't have the answers, you see, when it comes to the subject of origins, there are basically two views. Creation Creation based on this book, the Bible, given to us by the inspiration of the Creator. Or evolution, man's attempt to explain why we exist. You see, the world, supported by what is called science, claims that they have come up with the truth on the subject for the search for the truth on origins. They claim that evolution is true that it can be supported by the observable evidence. But the Bible makes it very clear, and we're going to go through some of the scriptures, even from the first verse, that there is a creator and there has been a creation. You know, often Christians try to reconcile the dilemma. They say, well, you know, science has determined that evolution is true, but God in the Word of God, makes the claim that he's the creator, so well, maybe God used evolution to create. I'm sure that you have heard of that view. You may be here and you may even support that view. Well, let me tell you from the beginning, if you have been here previously, hearing some of the sessions, let me make it clear. I was an evolutionist, and now I am a creationist. My conversion to Christianity was from evolution to creation to Christ. And I trust that I can make it clear by the end of this session, there is no room to take that mid-position. Either it's matter, chance, and time, or it's a supernatural creator God according to his plan by design. I do not believe that you can combine the two. I believe that... The creation biblical view is given to us by inspiration of God and it answers all of the questions. Now what I'm going to attempt to do in a few minutes, I always have these challenges. I take on too much information, try to cram it into a small segment of time, but we'll try it again. We're going to do a Bible study on creation from Genesis to Revelation, but I'm only going to take five minutes. And we're going to start with the first verse. Everyone knows it, Genesis 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created. 
the heaven and the earth. That's basic. That's foundational. That's the first verse in the Bible. God created. Isn't that interesting? That the Bible would begin with this profound statement. And we're told in the last verse of the first chapter, chapter 1, verse 31, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So the creation was completed, and it was good. It was perfect. But something happened. In Genesis chapter 3, we are told what happened. We are told that God has an adversary, and that God's adversary came to Eve in the Garden of Eden, in the embodiment of a serpent, and he enticed Eve to disobey what God had said. God had said, do not take of the forbidden tree. And Eve took of the forbidden tree. Satan said, you can be as the gods. Don't believe what God has told you. And so she took of the tree. Adam took of the tree. And as a result of their disobedience, sin and the separation and the curse took place upon planet Earth. And from that moment on, the creation began to degenerate and it was on its way down. No longer was it good. No longer was it perfect. And we read by the time we get to Genesis 6 that man had strayed so far from the Creator that God said he was grieved that he had created man and he warned that he would bring a judgment that he did and he wiped out planet Earth in a worldwide global catastrophic event. And I would like to show you all of the evidence that would support that. We'll touch on it in a few moments. But we're doing our study. Genesis to Revelation. Let's continue. Psalm 148, verses 1 to 5. In spite of the fall, the Bible makes numerous references to creation and its importance. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise ye him all his angels. Praise ye him all his hosts. Praise ye him sun and moon. Praise him, all ye stars of light. Praise him, ye heavens of heavens, and ye waters that be above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded, and they were created. Isaiah 45, verses 11 and 2. Thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and his Maker, Ask me the things to come concerning my sons and concerning the work of my hands, command ye me. I have made the earth and created man upon it. I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens and all their host have I commanded. Now to the New Testament. These are the words of Jesus. Mark 13, verse 19. For in those days shall be affliction such as was not from the beginning of creation, which God created unto this time, neither shall be. John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Are you getting the picture? As we go through these scriptures, it's talking about creation, that God made the nations. He made man. He made the planets. There was nothing that was made that he didn't make. Ephesians 3. And now we'll get a clear picture who the Creator is, if it's not already clear. Ephesians 3, beginning verse 8, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is the grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. You see, creation is absolutely foundational to the Christian faith because the Creator is Jesus Christ. 
You can't miss it. It's in the Scriptures. And now to Revelation chapter 4, verses 10 to 11. John in his vision saw this scene in heaven, and four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure They are and were created. Now, I've just chosen a few scriptures, and we've just chosen a few places in the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, like I said we would, you can't miss it. We have been reading from this book, and Jesus said, this is a revelation that is given by the inspiration. Thy word, he said, is truth. So references made to creation are not mythology, they're reality. Jesus is the creator, there has been a creation, the scriptures are true. But there's another very interesting and significant point that we must make. I've already made reference to it. The creator has an adversary, Satan, the serpent, the dragon, the devil, the one who deceives the whole world. This is found in the Bible. So if there is a creator and the creator has an adversary, wouldn't it be reasonable to suggest that the adversary has an agenda to deceive people from believing that there is a creator and that there has been a creation? I think so. I think that's reasonable. Wouldn't you, if you were God's adversary, want people to disbelieve this book and from the first verse? I believe that's Satan's plan. And I believe that he has an agenda. And with relationship to this subject matter that we're speaking about here this weekend, creation or evolution, I believe that there is an agenda to deceive the world from believing in creation. In fact, deceive the entire world. And it plays a significant role in blinding the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not understand the light of the glorious gospel. I do not believe that you can understand the gospel of Jesus Christ unless you understand how the gospel begins with a creator who created. And man was created in a union with the Creator, in a relationship that would have lasted forever. But because man was created with a free will, he chose not to remain in the relationship and was separated. And because of sin, man would have forever been separated and spent eternity in hell. But the Creator came to this earth by His grace and lived a perfect life in our place. We couldn't do it, but He did. And we are to acknowledge who He is and what He's done. And to ask for forgiveness and to acknowledge who he is or we are and what we've done. And then we can enter into a relationship with him that will last forever. That's the simple gospel. And you can't understand it unless you understand there is a creator. Creation is true. Evolution. Well, you see, I've chosen black instead of white. Creation for white for creation, black for evolution, because those two colors are as opposite as you can choose. And when it comes to the subject of origins, one is completely opposite from the other. Paul's warning regarding placing our trust in human reasoning, speculation, philosophy. Very important when it comes to this subject. Colossians 2, verses 6 to 8 As ye therefore receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you've been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, not after Christ. 
See, there are many scriptures that say this same thing. Place your trust in God and his word. You'll be like a tree whose roots are planted by a stream of water. But if you place your trust in man, well, you'll be like a bush in the desert, Jeremiah says. We're to place our trust in God, not man and man's ideas and philosophies, because if we do, we're going to be led astray. Or Paul's warning to Timothy, this time 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20 to 21. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. Notice that phrase. Science falsely, so-called. What does he mean by this? Well, what is science? Science is an endeavor to search for the truth. That's good. But science must be based on observing facts and then performing experiments, repeatable experiments. So we can come to conclusions that are based on observable evidence. That's good science. Paul says there's a science that's not science. They call it science, but it's falsely so-called because it's not supported by facts. It's not supported by observable evidence, repeatable experimentation. He said, Timothy, beware that you don't get caught in that trap and fall away from the truth. And each time that I read this portion of Scripture, I am sadly reminded of what happened to me. Yesterday, Dr. Oliver gave a testimony very similar to my own. We both grew up in the same, well, actually, we were born the same day, the same year, in the late 40s. We grew up through that same period of time, and when we were educated, we were introduced to the humanist agenda. We didn't know it. That's what happened to me when I went to university. It didn't take long. I lost my childlike faith. You see, as a child, I believed there was a God. I went to Sunday school. I learned Bible verses. And I loved biology and science. So when I graduated from high school, I went on to university, and it didn't take long, only a few months. And I soon discovered that my parents knew nothing, that the Bible was legend and mythology, and that my professors had the answers. And while I embraced their ideas and teachings and promoted them and became a lecturer, a zealous promoter of Darwinian evolution. I won't go into the details, but I stand before you today by God's grace as it came clear revelation to me over a period of time that I was wrong. And I discovered that the evidence clearly supports creation. And I started to read the Bible, the Genesis record, and the Bible came alive. There is a God. There has been a creation. And then I discovered I was separated from him because of my sin. I couldn't possibly please him. And one night in my living room, I cried out, God, what have you done or what will you do so I can have peace? And I remembered a verse. It was a verse my dad had written in the front of my Bible and gave to me when I was nine years old and I went to the shelf and pulled down the Bible and I opened it and I read in my dad's handwriting John 3.16. And I was 30 years old and I believed for the first time. The rest of my life has been an adventure as God has opened doors beyond my wildest dreams to take the message not only that creation is true but that the Bible is true from beginning to end, past, present, future. This book is God's Word, and God's Word tells that there is a Creator. And I want to demonstrate to you that we can believe it. This will be a very brief overview, just a few minutes again, looking at the two views, evolution, creation. The question, is evolutionary theory based on facts and good science? The question can creation view be supported by the observable evidence? Well, if you were here yesterday, you would have got a lot of the answers, but let me briefly give you an overview if you weren't. Evolution, that is the idea that all things exist because of matter, chance, and time is based on a number of assumptions. Let me give you a few. They say, that is those who believe in evolution, that it is true because they say in the past, 
Disorder became order following an explosion. A minute lump of matter blew up, dust all over the cosmos, and it came together by gravity to formulate galaxies, solar systems, and planets. No one has ever observed an explosion that has produced order. They say that evolution is true because they say, well, our planet exists because these particles came together, bumped together to form a planet with all of the right conditions to support life. Never been observed, but they believe that it occurred. They say that evolution is true because in the distant, unobservable past, non-living materials came together spontaneously to form life. No one has ever observed it occurring. They say that evolution is true because through billions of years of time, life progressed from simple to complex in a vertical direction. We have the Darwinian tree, but we have no intermediates between the kinds. You see, what Darwin actually observed was variation or change, but that variation occurred horizontally within genetic boundaries. People are very confused, you see. Darwin simply observed natural selection. That's a fact. It does occur. But in no way does horizontal variation provide a mechanism for vertical variation, which is the assumption which evolution claims. You see, it's a myth to believe that we have a mechanism to explain the progression and development of life, yet billions of people believe it. When it comes to the history of our earth, the claim is that while we have these visual explanations based on charts or drawings called the geological column, and over billions of years, as life lived and died, it was buried in the layers of the earth that were laid down and deposited gradually over hundreds of millions of years. But again, this whole worldview can be quickly refuted in the fact that we don't find the fossils in that sequential order in the Earth's crust. They're found buried in the Earth's crust, scrambled in many cases, sometimes upside down. Something has occurred in Earth's history which has brought about some kind of a global destruction. And in fact, we can verify that catastrophic events like those that have occurred recently at Mount St. Helens can produce the deposition of layers in a very short period of time it doesn't take hundreds of millions of years. And when we look at the biblical creation view, we have an explanation that an original perfect earth was wiped out and destroyed when the fountains of the great deep broke up, the windows of heaven were opened, and life was buried in the layers that were formed catastrophically worldwide. The evolutionary assumption is that we've evolved from brood ape-like creatures and we have paintings and murals and models based on fragments of fossils. But when we look at the facts that have been left to us by our ancestors, we discover that this biblical view, that man has always been man, man was wiped out by a global catastrophic event, eight survivors reconstructed the city, city of Babylon, the Tower of Babel, and from there man was dispersed and worldwide we find the sudden emergence of great civilizations and they are doing things we call mysteries, but they line up exactly with what the Bible claims, men who could build cities, alloy minerals together, make and play musical instruments, exactly what the Bible claims. Why am I a creationist? Well, by God's grace and because now I can see the facts, the observable evidence in a different light. Creation is a credible worldview. This idea that we've arisen from the slime, that we've evolved over billions of years of time, is a myth in the name of science, but it's not supported by science. And I would propose to you this morning that we are in a battle. The world claims that evolution is science. They claim that those who reject evolution and science are nothing more than religious people who refuse to look at the evidence. And so the battle goes on for the minds of our generation, particularly our children. 
when they're educated in the secular schools which have become the seminaries for the religion of humanism. Why do people believe in evolution? See, that was the question I asked myself after I became a Christian. How could I have embraced something that isn't true? And then I went back and I was reminded what occurred. I was taught to believe in evolution. And that's what happens. Children, from the moment they can read, kindergarten, through high school, college, museums, magazines, news, documentaries, and movies, were bombarded with this idea that the evolutionary view is the true way. And then I was tested on how well I believed. Well, my first midterm, I thought I'd done very well in university. When I went to see how well I had done, I discovered my name wasn't posted. So I went to see my professor, and he dug my paper out of the pile. He said, you're wasting your time and your parents' money. You see, I hadn't responded correctly according to what I was taught. I had some questions about what I had been taught. But I soon learned that if you're going to be successful, you can't question the system. That's how it works. Do you know that the founding fathers of evolution were not overwhelmed by facts that caused them to question creation? These were individuals who were looking for ways to explain away the Creator. And fallen man has always been looking for an excuse, not wanting to believe, not wanting to believe there's a Creator, because if there's a Creator, we're accountable. So if we can explain away the Creator, then we don't have to be accountable. And of course, there's spiritual help because the God of this world has a goal to blind our minds. Charles Darwin made it very clear in his autobiography that he underwent a similar kind of change, even the change that I underwent. At one time in his life, he believed in the Bible. He went to seminary. But he said things changed while on board the Beagle he said, I was quite orthodox. I remember being hardly laughed at by several officers for quoting the Bible as an unanswerable authority on some point of morality. But he says, I'd gradually come to see the Old Testament from its manifestly false history of the world with the Tower of Babel, the rainbow as a sign from its attributing to God, the feelings of a revengeful tyrant was no more to be trusted than the sacred books of the Hindus or the beliefs of any barbarian. He continues, Thus disbelief crept over me at a very slow rate, but was at last complete. The rate was so slow I felt no distress and have never since doubted even for a single second that my conclusion was correct. I can indeed hardly see how anyone ought to wish Christianity to be true. For if so, the plain language of the text seems to show that the men who do not believe, and this would include my father, brother, and almost all my best friends, will be everlastingly punished. And this is a damnable doctrine, he said. He said Christianity was a damnable doctrine. You see, there was a reason for this. Most people are not aware. Charles Darwin had a daughter die, a very young daughter die as a result of a disease. And it was at that point in his life it can be documented that he made a choice. That he would explain away the Creator. Oh yes, he'd done much of his research and various observations prior to this, but was reluctant to publish it. But when this event occurred, he just went ahead. And his ideas to explain away the Creator have been very effective as they've been carried by numerous others ever since. You see, evolutionism is the basis of atheism. For over 70 years, Karl Marx promoted the idea there is no God. Man is at the top of the evolutionary pile. And Darwinism was promoted to scientific atheism. Millions of people educated to believe that there's no creator. And if they even questioned that, well, they couldn't be educated. 
Here in the Western world, evolutionism is the basis of the religion of humanism. That can be documented. Francis Potter and others who came up with the Humanist Manifesto, 1993. There's no God, they said. The reason we exist is because of evolution. And then there's one other factor. Some may not be aware, but evolutionism is the basis of mysticism or the new religion which is so popular these days. Many call it the New Age. But it really isn't that new. You see, these various ideas that are being incorporated into our society are based on the concept that the evolutionary process continues. We have emerged. We've arisen from the slime. We're on our way upwards towards the divine. And man is about to take the next step of the evolutionary process to become a new and higher being. And what we need to introduce into our daily lives are practices from the East. The concept that anything and everything can be God. Because evolution is God. You see, it's nothing more than the basic belief of ancient Babylonianism which, by the way, is spreading worldwide. There is a revival in our day of ancient Babylonianism. And that's foretold in the Bible. Why is creation important? Well, let me give you some reasons. There are consequences, the Bible says, when we reject the overwhelming evidence that there is a creator. Take time later than stay and read Romans chapter 1, beginning the 18th verse. I will paraphrase for you. This is what Paul states. The evidence that God has created is so obvious from the things that he has made that if we reject that evidence, we are without excuse. Our foolish hearts are darkened. Professing to be wise, we become fools. And rather than believe in the truth of creation, we will believe in a lie. And then Paul makes some statements. He says this is what will occur. You can predict it. When you remove the creator from your thinking, this is what will occur. You'll begin to worship anything and everything as God, but not the God who created everything. He said that you can follow a downward pathway to immorality and depravity. As you remove the creator, now man makes up his own rules. And then he lists all kinds of human behavior. And by the way, when we read that list of the kinds of behavior to expect and you read the papers, the news of our day, you'll see the parallel. It's happening worldwide. A new age, mystical spirituality where you can believe that a tree is God, the sun is God, the moon is God, the earth is God. Yes, a spirituality, but it's not worshiping the creator who made everything. It's worshiping the creation. And our news items indicates exactly what Paul says we can expect. Men with men, women with women. And all kinds of immoral, depraved behavior. It's in the Bible. There are consequences, you see, when we reject the overwhelming evidence. Over these past few years, there has been a movement sweeping throughout North America of, well, highly educated scientists who have come to the conclusion that there has to be some kind of intelligent designer. The Darwinian view is bankrupt, and numerous books have been written, laying it out very clearly that the Darwinian explanation is inadequate. All kinds of documentaries have been produced. The evidence is overwhelming. When we weigh out the evidence, it favors design and therefore a designer. But nevertheless, the majority of those who hold to the view of evolution scoff the view that there could be a creator. Just recently, February 22nd, 2006, this article, over 500 PhD scientists proclaimed their doubts about Darwin's theory. 
Over 500 doctoral scientists have now signed a statement publicly expressing their skepticism about the contemporary theory of Darwinian evolution. The statement reads, We are skeptical of the claims of the ability of random mutation and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. Careful examination of the evidence for Darwinian theory should be encouraged. The list of 550 signatories includes member scientists from prestigious U.S. and Russian National Academy of Sciences. Signers include 154 biologists, 76 chemists, 63 physicists, Signers hold doctorates in biological sciences, physics, chemistry, mathematics, medicine, computer science, and related disciplines. But isn't this interesting? This article published February 11, 2006. Darwin Sunday. Churches to mark Darwin's birthday. Hundreds to join Evolution Sunday. Organized by Wisconsin Academic. While 500 or more PhDs are saying Darwinism is bankrupt, well, 500, almost 500 pastors from evangelical churches are saying are honoring Charles Darwin for providing an explanation for our origins. And I could tell you much more, but I don't have time. It is amazing to me as I travel, and I've been doing this for a quarter of a century, to see that many churches that once proclaimed that the Genesis record was true are now saying, you know what, we need to reevaluate. And in fact, they say, if we were to talk about creation in our churches, many people would get up and leave because they would be offended because they're evolutionists. What is happening in our society? Why is creation important? It's true. And you can't understand, as I said earlier, the gospel unless you understand there is a creator. It is so clear in the book of Acts, chapter 17. Do you remember Paul on Mars Hill? Well, there it is in the city of Greece. I've been there. And from Mars Hill, when you stand there and you look up, that's what you see. Paul could see the temple of the gods above, he could see the temple of the gods beneath. And there were these deities and demigods at Mars Hill that well, were set up as statues and idols. And Paul said to them, I see you're very spiritual, but I see also that you're deceived. He said there's a creator. He's given you breath. He's given you life. He's created the nations. You've been created but he told them that they were separated from the Creator because of their sin and they needed to ask for forgiveness. They needed to repent. And then he told them about the resurrected one, Jesus, the Creator, the one who had come and lived a perfect life and sacrificed his life upon the cross and his blood was shed and he died, but he was resurrected and he lives. And if we would acknowledge him and who he is and what he's done and ask for forgiveness... We could enter into a relationship with the Creator that would last for eternity, and he presented to them the gospel, but he began with the basis of the gospel, with creation. And there were three responses. Some disbelieved and scoffed. Same thing today. Almost every time I present a message like this, people will get angry. Or recently, I was speaking at a university in Western Canada. They nearly stoned me because I was simply presented an alternative to evolution. Some said they needed more time to consider the evidence. That's okay. But Jesus could come any day. And then there were those, when they heard what Paul said, believed. By the grace of God, they believed. They followed Paul and proclaimed the message that Jesus is the Savior. He's the Creator. Creation is absolutely foundational to the Christian faith. Now, as I conclude, I want to share with you some encounters that I have personally had in which I categorize as creation evangelism. I believe in this message so much that I have committed my life to go wherever the Lord leads and under whatever circumstances to take the message of the truth of creation. 
And God has opened doors beyond my wildest imagination. Since 1990, I've traveled to Russia 37 times and other republics of the former Soviet Union. Even before communism collapsed. In 1991, a book that we had authored, co-authored, was published in Russia in Russian. And on the morning that it was announced to the entire Soviet Union that the Soviet Union had collapsed, that Gorbachev said, no more Soviet Union, by God's grace, God allowed me to be on Russian national television in front of millions of people telling them about the Creator. And doors have opened for us throughout the nation as the Department of Education has asked us to come and teach teachers and professors the alternative to evolution. It's been unbelievable. And thousands, well, I could say hundreds of thousands of books have been distributed and tapes and DVDs. I want to tell you about Alex. I was speaking at a conference in Vancouver, Canada, a few years ago on creation, and after the third evening, a gentleman came up to me. He had some questions, and I could detect by his accent he was, well, he spoke Russian. I asked him if he was from Russia. He said, no, the Ukraine. I had a book with me. It's this book that I mentioned to you. It's called The Evidence for Creation. It's the first book translated into creation, printed in Russia. It happened December 1991. So I gave him a copy of the book as a gift. The next night, when I returned, he was at the door waiting for me. And he was so excited. He said, Roger, you won't believe what happened last night. He said, I took that book home and I showed it to my son, Alex. And when Alex saw the book, he said, Dad, that's the book. That's the book that I used when we were in Odessa. And then he told me this story. His son, also called Alex, was in grade 10 biology class. And his teacher was teaching evolution. And after the class, Alex went up to the teacher and he said, I don't believe in evolution. You see, their family had become Christians. And the teacher said, you don't believe in evolution, Alex. What do you believe? And he said, I believe in creation. And she started to laugh. She said, Alex, creation is just a myth. But she said, I tell you what, you seem quite serious. Why don't you put a presentation together? If you have any evidence for what you believe, let me know, and I'll let you give a presentation to the class. So Alex went home. He called a friend. He told him what the teacher had said. The friend said, I know where you can find a book. It's in the library, and it's called The Evidence for Creation. And it was one of these books that had been distributed through the commission, many of them all over Russia and other republics. And so he read the book, he prepared, he told the teacher he was ready, she let him teach a class, and after the class, Alex said, or she, the teacher said to Alex, I'd like you to do a second class. So Alex prepared a little bit more, he did a second class, and the teacher said, Alex, uh, uh, I'd like you to do a third class, I, I'd like you to invite the other teachers to hear what you have to say. And my husband, he's a biology professor. And so Alex did a third class, and the teachers and the they were dumbfounded. They'd never heard this simple, basic information that challenged what they had believed. And Alex's dad told me that after that, many of the teachers and the students started attending their church and became Christians. I could tell you about Ina, and I'll be brief. I was speaking at a symposium in Moscow, and this lady came 26 hours by train with one of these books to have me sign. And the book looked like it was in shreds. I said, what happened to this book? She said, every single person in our church and their families have read the book. And she said, please, could you come to my city? Stavropol, please come. I have connections with the Department of Education officials, and we will have a conference, and the teachers will come from all over the area to hear what you have to say. She said, I cannot possibly meet all of the invitations because after reading this book, I started teaching from it and I've been invited to all of these schools to come and teach them an alternative evolution. Please, please, please come. And so six months later, I went. And yes, it was true. Four to five hundred teachers. 
and we gave lectures. And as it has been throughout all of these times that we've traveled to Russia and spoken to scientists and teachers and educators, I could count the number of people that were in opposition on the two fingers. And then she took me to her school where she was teaching. And she had taken pictures from the book and she had redrawn them, put them on paper and were posting them on the blackboard and the teachers that she was teaching were sitting in the seats and as she was teaching creation they were opening their Bibles and looking at the verses. And I sat at the back and wept. Because when I came back to the USA it was the other way. We're headed in the other direction. So fast. And worse yet, it's Christians that are headed in this direction. Rejecting the truth of creation. Creation is absolutely foundational to the Christian faith. And we'll conclude with these words. The Bible makes it clear the Creator is the Redeemer, Colossians 1. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son in whom we have redemption through His blood even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. As some versions say, that he may have first place in everything. The creator who made everything wants first place in everything, including our lives. And that is important. And if there's one point that I have made here this morning that you will remember and understand, I trust it will be this. There is a Creator, and the Creator has provided a way that you can have a relationship with Him so that you might know Him and spend time with Him for eternity. Do you know Him? I trust that you will leave this place this morning differently than you've come because you've heard from God's Word and the importance of creation as the foundation of our faith. May God bless each one of you. You know, it makes me cry when I hear what God is doing in Russia, <clears throat> and I can see what the devil's doing in America. So if you don't know the Lord, I invite you to come up when we get ready to leave and spend some time up here. I'll be glad to pray with you. If you're backslidden, I got a letter on my website today from a backslidden man who was drawn away, went to a Christian church and drawn away into a terrible sin of homosexuality. I was asking for a way out. Read, it gets on indodays.com, and people write to me, and he, uh, I'm writing to him today and going to ask him to come out. Maybe you're suffering from these sins. See, if you reject the Creator, then there's no moral base anymore. Jesus said in chapter 10 of, of Mark, verse 6, he said, From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Remember that. The Creator has designed for our lives. And we need to come to that. In this generation, in this town, in this city, we live in a perverseness. If you look up and you've got good housekeeping medical book. You ever get good housekeeping medical book? Book on medicine, you know, how little medicine things. You open it up, look up homosexuality, it says perverseness. See, even good housekeeping knows it's not good for the house. God made you to come out from amongst the devil's ways and to dwell with him eternally. So I invite you to come up. You're backslidden. You've been tempted by these sins or any sins. And I want to pray with you. Roger and his wife Myrna will be right over here. 
and there's a table, and we want you to go and talk to them, ask them questions. There's books and things for there, uh, for sale there. We have uh, the firefighters for Christ back there. There's no fire in the building, but there, there's a fire in hell that burns forever, and they're trying to put that out in your life. They have different uh, tapes and CDs here. They attend our church. They're part of a national organization, and uh, we want you to meet them. And they give you free CDs and free tapes. Uh, anytime you want them, you just go to. They have many, many speakers, many, many teachers. R Rick Oliver, Dr. Oliver's table's over there. And the great table's back here with the great songs. And uh, I, I put one in the car the other night. I put their, their newest CD in my car, and I couldn't keep that, that gas pedal from the metal. <laughs> it made me want to just ride and ride. So uh, why don't you take a look at theirs and come back this afternoon at 4 p.m. Now, how long is the concert? About an hour and a half, and you have a break, and then we'll go into the evening, evening uh, study. So we all stand. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, and may we come together again. And if the rapture comes, we're going to meet together by the creature that looks like a man. So just meet us there. We're going to be over by that creature that looks like a man. And we'll meet there and say, hi, how you doing? Where are you going? And I want to see a white horse, too, because they're probably all the same, but I bet you have very distinctive white horse that you're going to get. So, Lord, bless you. Father, we pray as we leave, Lord, you'd fill us with your Holy Ghost and that we'd be witnesses for Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't miss the rest of this conference.